I hit record. All right. Uh, so thank you everyone to, for coming to the usual Fedora Kernel talk. For those who don't know me, I'm Laura Abbott. I'm one of the members of the uh, Fedora Kernel team. The Fedora Kernel team is part of Fedora Engineering, uh, managed by Paul Frields at Red Hat. It is my full-time job to make the Fedora Kernel to be the best it can be. Okay. So uh, general overview about uh, what's going to be talked about here. We're going to talk about who's actually working on the Fedora kernel, uh, things we've worked on last year, things we're going to work on last year, pretty simple. Uh, several of the things you're going to hear about are pretty similar to what you heard in the um, Fedora Project Leader talk this morning, a lot of the same things. Um, I wrote mine independently, just having them come out of the way. Um, you'll also hear several themes come up a lot, uh, especially in terms of getting new contributors. Okay. So who actually makes the kernel happen? Uh, LWN, the Linux news site, likes to put out a report each release about who is actually contributing to the upstream uh, kernel project. These days, most of the contributors to the upstream kernel project are paid contributors by companies. There are still a handful of non-paid contributors or just hobbyist contributors, but by and large, most contributors to the upstream project are paid maintainers. I'd say the Fedora kernel um, follows a similar path. We don't get a whole lot of general community contributions. Um, we want to change this. But the type of contributions we do tend to see from the community tends to be uh, things like my heart, my laptop isn't working for this specific thing, uh, problems that are very specifically focused on individual hardware. This is value. We always appreciate these contributions, especially when they come with a specific problem and a specific patch. Anytime I don't have to go looking for a patch or someone provides that, or even just brings a problem to my attention that helps to overall uh, make the um, process better. Um, uh, so again, we encourage you to um, make contributions. I can't guarantee that every contribution will be accepted, but bringing a problem or learning to us is a good way to get it to our attention, so we in fact know a problem that exists. So um, thank you to everyone who has contributed to the kernel as a community, or the community over the past year. Okay, so who else is making the kernel happen? Uh, we work with a lot of engineers who have specific focus areas. The kernel is a big piece of software. The number of people who are familiar with all of it can be counted on one hand if that Especially in the kernel, you end up with people who end up with um, a particular area of expertise. Uh, they work on a lot. So we work with a handful of groups. Um, graphics. Graphics is a big area where we get help. Um, uh, graphics are one of the most common places where we see um, problems. Graphics is broken down by teams. We have different teams working on the i915, Nouveau, etc. The same people who work on the user space drivers also work on the kernel drivers. This is why if you report a kernel graphics bug, you'll often see the component change to something that looks like it goes for a uh, user space component. This isn't us trying to get rid of the bug or just automatically or not care about it. It's because it helps us do the tracking. Um, so yay for the graphics team to help us uh, make things better. The, um, another area we get help with is input drivers. Uh, this is especially true for things like laptops. Laptops seem to have uh, different quirks each time, um, different uh, inputs, keyboard mappings, something always seems to be breaking. And one of the reasons why we, re we rely on other people um, uh, to have, who have the specialized knowledge to help with us is because they know exactly where to go looking for things, as opposed to me, for example, trying to guess where things are supposed to go. So, especially with input drivers, uh, you generally get people who know exactly what file to change to match on a specific PCIe. Generally, helps make things better. Uh, Architecture-specific fixes. Uh, the Fedora Core team tends to work mostly on x86. Um, it's just on higher support modules. There are a handful of other teams who help to support other Fedora architectures: uh, ARM, ARM64, PowerPC, S390. Um, the people who uh, work on those, they do a great job of pulling in fixes and making sure those are validated. Um, so thank you to everyone from uh, those who are also working with the Fedora kernel team. So I basically talked about everyone except the actual uh, Fedora kernel team. Um, so who exactly is on the team? So there's three of us uh, this past year. There's been Josh Boyer, Justin Forbes, and 
and me. Um, so I talked a lot about what everyone else does. So probably I think what the rest of us tend to do with our time is um, uh, releases. This includes your daily raw height updates, stable updates, rebases. We take the release kernel that comes from upstream and make sure it actually gets out to Fedora. Um, when I was working on my goals for this year, uh, I spent a long time trying to figure out exactly how to describe the process of doing the updates. When I describe it, doing the updates, it sometimes sounds like you could replace me with a CI bot and just get rid of me completely. I think we've concluded you can't quite do that yet. And I think a lot of what we do with releases and uh, what we try and do is really we're tracking everything, both what's in the kernel and upstream. Um, uh, the three of us on the team, we try and uh, stay active on reading LKML, knowing what's out there. So the hope is, is that we'll be familiar enough with, with um, what's out there when bugs are reported that we'll be, be able to have an idea about, hey, I think I saw a patch to make this work, or hmm, I think I saw a change that might have broken something like this. So really, we're trying to help um, set the direction the Fedora kernel is moving. And we're always trying to listen to everyone as well to find out exactly what everyone else wants the Fedora kernel to go. Um, the listening is important because we don't just want to make decisions in a vacuum. Um, we really want to be make sure that the kernel is moving um, uh, and solving the important, same important problems as the overall Fedora project. Okay. Okay, so that's everyone who does things. So what exactly are we putting together? Um, we, the kernel is still just a single project. Uh, single does not mean simple, though. Um, there are about 10,000 lines of configuration, kernel configuration options uh, sitting in the package git directory. The kernel at spec file itself is about 2,000 lines when you take out the, the change log, so quite a behemoth that'll be a bit intimidating. Uh, we, often get, we sometimes get questions about why is there only one kernel? Why is there not something like kernel cloud, kernel server, kernel IoT, whatever? Um, and I think the, a lot of the answer is, is that the kernel is complex enough as is. We have enough um, uh, time dealing with the support we have without trying to add complexity. Um, for some architectures like ARM and um, and uh, x86 that have 32-bit variants, we do offer PAE variants. PowerPC has a couple of architecture options as well. And those architecture options that we have already add to the complexity. So the small amount that we do have for actions, packages um, add stuff as well. I would probably say that if the Fedora Council came to us tomorrow and said, um, we really want to drive this idea of um, different uh, kernel packages, here's all the resources you need to make it happen, we could do that. But until that happens, I, we're just going to um, be working with a single unified kernel. But even if we can't have different packages, what we are dedicated to doing is trying to enable as many options um, as possible. If a driver can be enabled as a module, uh, we want to enable it. We want to have it available for people to use. Um, obviously, this we can't enable everything all at once. We are eventually going to have to make some trade-offs. Um, when that happens, we're ultimately going to be looking for what direction is Fedora moving and um, who is this overall going to be benefiting. Um, so again, this is where we appreciate hearing uh, input. Without knowing what people want, we won't have any idea how to make these decisions. Okay, let's talk about some numbers. Um, sometimes we've talked about bugzilla numbers. For various reasons, I don't like talking about bugzilla numbers. I don't think they're a great reflection of what we do. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is some stats related to uh, actual commits to the package git repository. I ran some numbers for one year from July 1st, 2015 to June 30th, 2016. Uh, this range was kind of chosen somewhat accidentally. Um, I, that was, this was about the time period when I started working on the presentation. But it turns out I think this was a nice snapshot that shows the ebb of flow of Fedora releases and where we end up spending uh, most of our time. Um, we had F21 who went uh, EOL partway through the period, F22 who went EOL towards the end of the end of uh, this period, F23 was released during the middle of the period, F24 towards the end, and Rawhide giving its usual rolling release. So a wide variety of releases. So the basic stats, uh, this is the number of actual individual com git commits we made to the various branches. 
this is everything, bug fixes, um, updates, oops, I screwed that up, commit, um, for we see. And I say this does a nice job of showing um, that the activity really falls out towards EOL. You can definitely tell that F21 has fewer commits uh, than any, anything else. If you notice that F24 there has um, a, large, a pretty large number of commits as well, that's because um, some of the time period included the time before uh, Rawhide came out. So this just serves to reemphasize that uh, today's Rawhide is tomorrow's stable release. So testing and reporting on Rawhide is to, is very important. Um, for those who do test rawhide and treat bugs, thank you once again. Okay, uh, so I led a little bit. I'm going to look at some bugzilla numbers, but in a slightly different way. Um, this is the number of commits that were actually tagged with the uh, bugzilla numbers. Um, if you notice, this has a slightly different curve. Uh, F23 ended up with the most bugzilla tags over the entire course of the period. Um, I think this kind of matches with what we saw in the state of Fedora this morning is that there's an adoption curve. So F23 was stable for the longest during this period, so therefore it had the most users and therefore you're going to um, get the most bugs. Uh, if you notice, um, there's, there's definitely a fall off though of bugs. Um, towards, as uh, releases go EOL, we definitely don't see a lot of um, activity there. Um, I was on vacation the week before F22 went to uh, EOL, when it came back, there were no bug reports for F22, which was a nice change from the usual flood of stuff in my inbox. Um, you also note that Rawhide has a fewer, no, has a less number of bugs than anything. Um, I, I attribute this to the fact that Rawhide has a smaller uh, user base and therefore you just get fewer people reporting bugs. Okay, so this is the number of um, actual updates we did. This includes uh, major updates going from, for example, 4.5 to 4.6, and also the stable updates, so 4.5.1 to 4.5.2. Um, this is again shows the uh, a curve of fall off. You have almost half of uh, e each of them. Um, and again, the number for F24 includes um, some of the work for Rawhide. And as you can see, Rawhide definitely keeps us uh, pretty busy and, and active for what we contribute. Um, I, the EOL falloff, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we did for F22. Um, so part of it is releases go towards EOL. We have to figure out the right balance of um, get pushing a new kernel update versus staying on an older release. So about the time that F22 was headed towards EOL, um, a long-term stable uh, kernel was released, 4.4. Uh, this is uh, a kernel that's um, is ded gets dedicated support and updates for um, a couple of years. And we decided to keep uh, F22 on um, this long-term update. And honestly, I think it worked out uh, pretty well. What we were finding is, is that it was taking longer and longer for the updates to actually get enough karma um, in Bodhi to actually go out. So instead of actually having to try and wait for karma for a big update, we could just wait for a smaller update. And therefore, F22 was able to remain the stability. So I think, um, evaluating when to do the updates as far as when things go EOL. This is something we're going to continue to do to look at when it's appropriate to rebase versus just keep it. Okay, um, so this is uh, the kernel versions that were covered during this time period. Uh, so if we take these numbers to be typical um, for a Fedora release, then this means um, during the rough life cycle of a Fedora um, for Fedora release, you'll probably get about four or so major kernel updates of, or about a year. Um, this is not too surprising if you look how things go. Uh, the upstream kernel gets released on a very, very regular basis, about every 80 days. Um, we aim to get uh, new kernel releases out um, roughly by the second stable update that comes out, which means roughly two-ish weeks. Um, so for example, uh, 4.7 was released uh, a week or two ago, and I expect um, as I, when I get back from uh, Flock, one of the things I'm going to be working on is moving that into um, an update for F24, F23, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's what we want to try and do. And then Rawhide, the number is still up there. So, okay, summary of what I just talked about, um, some of this I already mentioned is that older releases have a fall off. Not surprisingly, there are fewer people reporting bugs. Um, 
there, and therefore we're going to spend uh, less time trying to get them updates. Um, it's also worth noting is that we're, we are pulling in bug fixes in addition to uh, what's coming to stable. And I think this is a positive sign for us is that we are trying to be proactive and not just rely on the stable updates, but also bring in to uh, whatever um, people come in. Oftentimes this may mean is that um, the patches we bring in may have a short life. Uh, they may just get replaced by the next stable update. But the point is, is that we're trying to get the uh, fixes in and um, new features in as soon as we can and out to people. Uh, Rawhide also keeps us pretty busy. Um, I did the math and it really is getting about one commit a working day on average. Um, this is, I think, has, tends to be heaviest during the two week uh, merge window for the kernel, but um, that it, Rawhide really is um, a big portion of our work. And finally, um, your release is going to get several, di several different kernel versions uh, during its life cycle. Uh, Fedora is a fast-moving distribution, and I think this is a real opportunity um, to get a chance to make sure Fedora is working with um, new hardware and also get a chance to report more bugs. Um, so it has its pluses and minuses, but I think it's great to work with. Okay. Um, so what have we learned over this past year? Um, I think we've, we've uh, come to internalize some lessons. Um, first, people don't like bugs. Uh, this really sounds obvious. Um, people want their hardware to work, and when it doesn't, um, they get grumpy. Uh, I'm the same way. When my hardware doesn't work, uh, I get pretty grumpy. But I think we've discovered the only thing people hate more than um, uh, bugs is surprise bugs. Uh, when something used to work, and when it didn't, th then it stops working, um, it gets, it's not a great experience. Um, I think the situation we ran into with some of the Dell XPS sound hardware is a good example of this. Uh, so the software support for the Dell XPS sound hardware was on the bleeding edge, um, and uh, the most reliable ways we found to be able to get to work involved um, kind of a hack of a kernel config option that uh, had some conflicts with secure boot. Um, we turned it on because we wanted to try and get the hardware working. But then eventually I decided I wanted to try and turn it off so that we could see if we can get it working properly and make sure that we could actually support it properly. Um, people really were unhappy when I pushed the update and things broke. And I think the biggest mistake here was, um, not, realize, was not realizing that people would, be happy, would not be happy by this. And even if it's possible to later fix it with another way, the experience of having something break um, is really not great. So planning is key. And I'll be talking a little bit more in the future about what we're going to try and do to prevent things like this. Uh, so as far as where bugs are coming from, um, most of them are coming from the upstream project, not from Fedora itself. I say this is good because, well, we're not creating any bugs, but it's bad because it also means is that there's, it's a lot harder to figure out where the bugs uh, are trying to come from. Um, Several million lines of code and three people plus whoever else, all the other people I talked about who are contributing, it's a, it's a lot to manage. Um, we really try and report the bugs upstream where we can. We encourage, I encourage you to report bugs upstream as well. Uh, the process isn't perfect though. Um, sometimes we get bug reports that for various reasons we can't do anything with. Uh, sometimes we report bugs to maintainers upstream and maintainers don't respond. And it really is frustrating, just because I think one thing at least I've realized is that I like fixing bugs. I like being able to close bugs with um, a patch, because I know it's helping to overall make things better. Um, so the kernel is a big project that we really try and do the best we can in terms of fixing bugs and getting things out there. Um, uh, finally, we really want to try and get more people um, involved. Uh, we love to see people who try and um, propose fixes that they either try and create themselves or, or have found. Um, the kernel is a project for everyone. Um, uh, so there seems to be this myth with the kernel that you have to be X amount of awesome before you can contribute to the kernel. Um, this is really not true. If you want to contribute to the kernel, you have already met the awesomeness level. Um, again, not every contribution will be accepted but we want this to be a place where you can learn and have a discussion about uh, what you try and submit. Um, if you have any feedback about ways you can, we can help make this better for you to contribute, um, I'd love to hear it. Okay, 
uh, goals. So this is some of the stuff that we had for goals for last year. So last year we talked about doing some work on power management. Um, I set out, I did some work related to power management, I produced some graphs, but I think ultimately we concluded that just saying make power management better in the kernel, it's not a great goal. Um, it doesn't have a clear deadline. And I think what we decided is, is that um, we certainly care about power management, but what we're looking for is problems that have been identified as being specific to the kernel and not, say, caused by misbehaving user space processes, and also um, ones that can actually be fixed without support from the hardware vendor, just because um, sometimes uh, power management problems can be linked to uh, hardware vendors having a specific magic bit or making choices in their firmware that we can't actually fix. So again, we care about power management, but this isn't going to be one of our top priorities this year, unless we come, come up with a specific goal. Um, automation and testing. So uh, this has really, I think, been a, a high point for us. Uh, and a lot of this work has been done by Justin Forbes, one of the members of our team here. Um, he's put in a lot of work to make sure we're getting uh, regular builds. And um, every time we pu push a build, uh, we, uh, an, autom an automated set of kernel tests is running. Um, and he's also working on a regression test framework. So I talked about how people don't like surprise bugs. One of the areas where we can tend to hit a lot of surprise bugs is third-party modules, um, NVIDIA modules, VMware. These are modules we can't officially support, but people still want to run them. And inevitably, when they break, people will come to us, and then we have to have a back and forth about saying, that's a third-party module, we don't support it, and then close the bug. And um, a lot of times people are, even if we can't support it, people are still not happy that something they were using broke. So the hope is, is that uh, we can create a dashboard and do preemptive testing about um, the third-party modules so that people will at least be aware of what's going on. And for example, if they see that uh, the next kernel update is going to break their virtual box drivers, they may decide to hold off on updating the kernel until that can be fixed. And if, perhaps even if they see that something's broken, they can report it to the actual third-party maintainers and maybe even get it fixed faster. So the hope is, is that overall this gives um, more information out to everyone to be able to and improve their experience and improve our experience with Bookzilla. And again, that's all on Justin. And uh, upstream. So we always have a goal about working with the upstream um, kernel community. The kernel community is a very individual relationship-based community. You have much more success in the kernel if people know who you are because you're doing good work. This applies even to people who are working at companies like Red Hat. Uh, the maintainers say repeatedly, we don't care what company you work for, we care who you are. So it's really in the Fedora project's best interest to have people who are actively involved in the kernel community um, contributing. And I'd say um, each of us on the team has our own pet areas we like to work at. Um, so I have a lot of areas. Um, I work on a few things related to ARM and mobile, um, sometimes poke at memory management, sometimes do a little bit of security work. Um, if you're interested in any of these areas and would like to know more, I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards or over a beer. Um, and uh, the kernel community also really likes it when we can submit bug fixes and bisection results upstream. So uh, this is why it's also in our interest to make sure everyone is reporting bugs where they can upstream. It, helps to overall grow everything up there and the connections there. Um, this is a goal that's never actually going to be finished. I don't think we're ever going to be say, we're done with upstream for this year, yay. But um, it's important to describe why we think this is important to keep saying, doing it every year. And it's overall because we want to make sure that by working upstream, we're giving Fedora the best experience possible. Okay. Um, so this is some stuff that may have been hotter last year and is maybe less so this year. Uh, last year there was a lot of talk about 32-bit being on the decline. Um, I'd say this year this is still the case. And even the general community there's been a little bit more discussion about 32-bit um, bugs and how to find and test them because fewer people are actually testing and finding them. Um, an example to highlight this is that earlier in the year there was an issue where the 32-bit live CD uh, wouldn't actually boot up. Um, it was bouncing around between the kernel, bootloaders, um, and it, it was sort of stalled out for a long time. And uh, 
eventually we had a few members of the community step in to help to um, do some testing and bring it to resolution. And I think this sort of go, this continues to go with our strategy in the kernel of um, keeping 32-bit issues low priority and letting the community um, help out with it. So if you care about 32-bit issues, um, uh, please make sure you're testing and reporting them directly upstream and letting us know when you find the bugs. Uh, again, if you find it, if you have, um, if you if you found patches that fix your problem, those are really easy for us to turn in. So, and again, uh, thank you to those who do try and keep 32-bit alive for doing the hard work there. Uh, Butterfish. So Butterfish seemed to be a really hot topic last year, and um, this year, not so much. We haven't got a lot of questions about it. Um, I'd say our opinions are still the same as last year. Uh, Butterfish is uh, is a solid file system that is not the right default choice for Fedora. Um, those who have done their own research can decide to use it for their file systems, but we don't think it's the right choice right now. Um, we continue to monitor the situation, and if something changes, um, we'd be happy to let you know. Why do you think it's the right choice? Generally, uh, so for the question is, why do we think it's not the right choice? It's they're still finding bugs that can possibly affect um, production servers, I think. And the real thing is, is that for most Fedora users are individual users who don't have a lot of data duplication. Um, where it's being used is in big companies like, say, Facebook, where they have a lot more support to be able to deal with, I'd say, fi possible file system issues, whereas an individual user, you may just end up being out of luck and you've lost your data. So it's. It's, it's, it's certainly an option, but I think for the community Fedora is going for, it's not the right choice right now. I want to add that every time we've had that conversation, one of the developers has showed up on our mailing list, like the Butter as a developer, and said, please don't make this the default yet. Yes. So um, that's <laughs> hard to argue with. <laughs> well, yes. he's, he's not going to do that anymore, though. Um, this past time last year, he said he was telling us no, and he's not interested in this conversation anymore, so please stop asking. <laughs> All right, so. yeah, for the recording or camera, um, basically the Butterfish maintainers have actually come back to us and they have actually said, no, please don't make it the default as well. So that's a, another contribu big contributing factor so for why it's not the default. Okay, so uh, KDBus. Um, okay, so this has actually had some uh, great, uh, relatively new updates, but um, KDBus was uh, an in-kernel uh, IPC mechanism trying to bring dbus, the dbus protocol, into the kernel. Um, the developers pushed it, and it was not very well received. There was a lot of back and forth. Um, people concluded that there were some security and performance issues. And um, ultimately, the kdbus developers uh, decided to withdraw the patches, and we dropped them from Rawhide. And then we basically didn't hear anything about it for a long time. And then uh, this past week, um, there was some um, planning for kernel summit in uh, November where all the kernel developers get together. And then one of the KDBus developers has, has announced they want to have a discussion about their new project called uh, Bus One. So they're clearly out there and being active. Um, but I think they're trying to do things a little bit more transparently and actually work with the community to get things out there. As far as what it means for Fedora, um, uh, I think the plan is just to take a wait and see approach. If uh, they come to us and say, we'd like you to bring this into Rawhide like you did for KD Best for testing, uh, we'll certainly be willing to have a discussion about whether it's right. But until now, we're just going to keep on um, be active and re review exactly what's out there. Okay. okay, so that was last year. So then what are we going to do this year? Um, as mentioned uh, before, we want to make sure we're having good surprises, not bad surprises. Uh, we want to make sure that it's, a su it's great when your hardware works and less when your hardware doesn't work. Um, so again, I talked about the third-party um, module regression framework. That's definitely on our goals. We also want to try and increase the variety of hardware um, we're testing on to try and find bugs. Um, hopefully, we want to try and find bugs before all you in the community find things. Um, we also want to try and increase our communication. Being kernel developers, uh, our work is very focused and a little bit more insular in nature. Everyone depends on the kernel and that the kernel is needed to run, but because of our, the way things work is that we don't end up communicating with um, 
uh, a lot of people. It's very easy for us to get absorbed in our own world and not actually share what we're doing. So we, we want to fix this. We want to find uh, new ways to be able to share um, what we're working on and why we're excited to be uh, kernel developers. Um, uh, all of us have blogs. Sometimes we write about things. Um, I, on my blog, I write about some things related to Fedora. Sometimes I just complain. Um, but it's, the real thing is that sometimes it's hard to know exactly what to write about. So if you have things in the kernel you'd like to see, um, please let us know, and we can possibly uh, turn it into something um, for that. Um, so we'd also um, like to, we're also going to try and work to improve that tooling. Um, so we're a small team of full-time de kernel developers, and a small team doesn't scale to a growing community. Uh, but what does scale is better tools to be able to make dealing with the kernel easier. Um, a good example is uh, my bisection, is a bisection script. So I've had a pet project about having a set of Python scripts uh, to be able to make bisecting the kernel easier. Um, and the people that have used it have found it um, really useful. I got a, another one today with some feedback I need to look at. But the point is, is that this is, um, it's tools that make it so that uh, the community can solve their problems um, easier without having to do as much back and forth and such uh, through um, Bugzilla. Um, so th this summer we've had an intern through the outreach program, Miguel, who's been working on trying to help improve some of the scripting um, that we've had floating around in the uh, script. Um, he's been doing a great job and my hope is, is that by the end of the summer there'll be some scripts that will be useful for things like building the kernel and applying patches. Um, none of this is saying is that we don't want you to interact with us, but it's really just to help reduce the time to solve your problems and make it easier to reduce the back and forth and get to actually solving the issues. And um, again, if you have suggestions for tooling you think would make uh, your life easier for the kernel, I'd love to hear it. Um, finally, once again, we really do want to get more people involved. Um, you've heard me mention this several times by now, but I really want to emphasize it just because the kernel gets a bad reputation for being difficult to work with, and we really want to work to change that. Um, generally, when you hear about the kernel, is that you generally hear upstream first, upstream first, and it's true, we do want people to interact with the upstream, but realistically, the first experience most users are going to have with the kernel is probably going to be their um, distro. So, therefore, we want to make sure we're having the right environment. Um, so, we want to expand on what we've done for outreach e to help make it so that make it easier for easier for new contributors. Um, so come try things out with us. Ask us questions. We really want this to be a positive environment where uh, you can learn and um, be able to uh, grow your own knowledge and help help us as well. Um, again, uh, we are here for the for the communicate. Yeah. We are here to help the community. So participation and helping you is part of our job. Let's see. Finally, um, that's a link on the Fedora Project Wiki for um, some, some more of our yearly goals and details if you have any more questions. Okay, and I think that's it. So, questions? Uh, yes? Um, so, back in your slide, you went through uh, mm -hmm. a number of commits mm -hmm. that Rawhide has. Yeah. I think over the course of that year, you had like 500, right? Yeah. But I just wanted to point out that, yes, that's 500 commits to package repository, but it actually, each one of those commits represents a multitude of commits upstream, right? Um, so like when we do rebases in Rawhide, uh, like right now the 4 8 merge window is open, every single one of those commits can map to like 2,000 commits upstream. Um, it, it gives it a little bit more impact when you're talking about like exactly what those commits represent. And it goes down from there, but even some of the stable kernel updates bring in like numbers seem small, like when I was looking at it, like, man, those numbers seem really small, but actually, in, in reality, they're very large changes. That's a good point. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, I, I, I was just confused because I've been to these talks before, and I've been playing at the convention, what goes on in the kernel, and one of the things was we were always told upstream, 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 and in fact, that nothing could even get into the Fedora kernel unless it had made it into at least been pulled into a point release upstream. And so 
I sort of took that as don't bother us, go upstream and work with your issue and then wait till it comes downstream so that, or wait till we know it's at least going upstream and then talk to the Fenora people. That, that, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Still, I'm not so, sure that. okay, yeah, that's a good point. And I think uh, that's true, that's what we want to happen, but at the same time, um, it can be, the kernel community can be intimidating yes. to work with. So what I'd, I'd like to basically, is, is that if there are problems, if there are ways that we can make it easier for you to contribute upstream, then we'd like to help with that. And if that means occasionally looking at a patch, then we can, we can see of that. So basically we, we want to try and be the, the resource to let you be able to get stuff um, upstream. Um, okay. So it's, it's basically, we, we want to be the guiding hand, so. It's the kinder, gentler. Yeah. And then you said that, that you wanted to be more communicative. Mm -hmm. well, what is the proper way? Because I know there's a Fedora Carl mailing list that doesn't really get much discussion. We can, there's the IRC channel that gets very little, unless you're occasional. Yeah. Not often. So, I, um, I mean, either of those, uh, th there's no reason why there can't be more discussion on, on those mailing lists, okay. I think, or IRC. I think it's they've been quiet just because people haven't been participating. Yeah. There's no reason to say is that we can't have um, discussions there. I think we, we might, I think probably what I'd like to see happen is have some discussions there, and then perhaps is that if it's um, to a point we can say, okay, this has been a good discussion, now can we um, per perhaps propose this upstream? So the idea is, is that we can, we can, <coughs> We can be for, be an incubator for ideas, maybe for upstream, and then, but eventually, be able to get them to the kernel community. So, and, and to add to that, um, you know, in the past, like I had done Fedora kernel reports, right, like on a monthly basis, and that's fine. It, it took like a day to pull out data together and I'd send it out, but there'd be no feedback, right? So, like, am I talking to myself on this mailing list? Um, <laughs> so, the mailing list itself is really hard to know whether people are even. That's true. And, and I'm not I'm not asking like people to reply to say, this is awesome, thanks every yeah. single time, but it's just good to know that if, if people found that yeah. valuable, then that's always something we can look at. I mean everybody loves the kernel until they have a problem with it. So yeah, well that's what else is nobody reads the change log on the kernel and say that until something has gone wrong and then they try to say, uh oh, maybe it's this item that changed log. I used to write those messages, but I did not notice when they stopped. So. Exactly, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I mean I'd also add is, is that we say we want people to contribute. I don't think we we're still working on figuring out ways to do this. So if you have suggestions, again, we, we'd, we'd like to hear this. But the point is, is that we want to try and be, we, we want to try and be interacting more, and not just be in our own little kernel world, huddled up in a blanket, packing on a laptop. So maybe uh, that would actually be uh, something to do as a collaborative project, another part of the uh, kernel project, like uh, docs or something. Just uh, go over the uh, the marketing group, just say, you know, something isn't a kernel developer. That's a that's a really good point, and this is I think one of the valuable things I've gotten out of um, mentoring with outreach is is that I figured out I, I I have a better idea about how exactly to help new people uh, get started and um, everything there, and I think part of this is also figuring out what are tasks that are good for new people as, as well. So, um, but but that, that's a good suggestion. I'll I think I'll think if I can find some candidates for that. So, yes. Brian, you was talking about the fact that. Uh, one commit to the Fedora repo, you can do a several hundred or thousands commit to upstream. Do you pick up individually every commit from upstream, uh, which uh, you are going to then commit to Fedora, or is it just like very base, like set to upstream and commit all the patches? Yeah, so. For Rawhide, we do a snapshot, which is where we take whatever is of the master at that time and then pull it in as a patch, and then rebase whatever else we're carrying on, on top of that. Um, for stable updates, again, we're pulling in what comes in as a patch and bring that in. Does that? And then the idea is, is that each Fedora commit is going to be correspond to a patch or a Git. I'm sorry, is that answering your question or? It's like every Rawhide, every day Rawhide is a little micro. Stable releases, we wait much longer, right? So, like, Fedora 24 is on 4.6.5 right now. And 
know, go four six, probably six before it before it goes to four seven. And then when we go to four seven, it's the whole four seven at one time. It's like one big chunk. But rawhide is like little tiny micro pieces all day. So at least for what we have, at least in our sources, there's generally um, uh, the last stable update then an RC patch, and then a Git patch on, on top of that for uh, Rawhide, and then um, for stable releases, we have uh, the release base 4. Dot whatever kernel, and then the patch, the dot .x on top of that. So you have, you end up, you end up having a patches coming in in different parts, so. Yep? Sorry. Is there any documentation on how you guys deal with, work with the kernel? Because here's my issue. Um, say I want a patch. Mm -hmm. What do I normally do? Well, I do the spec, do the patch, get the spec, build it in Koji, wait hours, and, and my build machine is fast. Then install the package, which I know is dumb because there's a far easier way to do it, but I don't want to get to the point where I'm you know, editing rub.com to get it to you know, boot. I know there must be a simpler way to build it because otherwise you guys couldn't wait for three hours for code to build and change. But yet I don't want to go down to the raw kernel service. You know, I, I like dealing with the package that you guys produce the spec file. And so as far as what you're saying, um, yeah, we do actually wait for, at least on my machine when I'm doing local builds, um, I will be very patient and wait for it to build. Uh, there's also, there's now a fast build script, which makes things a little bit better if you want to test things locally. Um, but, uh, but but I think to your that's for your specific question. The more general question about what we do, we've tried to keep the wiki, wiki up to date with um, steps and things like that. So uh, if you take around uh, the Fedora project um, kernel, there's the main page. If I didn't you realize it was up to date, uh, at, at least a lot of times you, try. <laughs> you learn to, 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 to sort of like okay, there's a wiki page, but because it was written in 2008, it doesn't help me. Okay, so when, when Laura joined us uh, a little over a year ago, yeah. uh, one of her first tasks was to update all that stuff that we had developed oh. for eight years. Uh -huh. It was mostly because I was the first really new person in a long time, so therefore we were discovering um, exactly what actually oh. was not documented. So um, I tried to do that uh, to keep it up to date. Um, I, I think. Most of the steps right now are reasonably up to date. If you find things that aren't, uh, you're welcome to create some discussion on the mailing list. So. If anybody knows how to write plugins for MediaWiki, I have a dream of having one in our MediaWiki which makes pages get older looking with like curling and like, stains and cobwebs on them as they are untied. Uh, See, that's actually, is a terrible thing though. That's a, <laughs> it is awesome that's for a, this purpose. That's a bad motivation though, because what if you think like the the older stuff looks cooler, like you've got spider webs. Right. Stuff. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> it's like got documentation. <laughs> um, so back to your point, Dibs. Yeah. There is no magic bullet. If you like the package and have management aspects of it, then you have to wait for the RPM build. Um, yeah. And like when I was doing raw factory bases, what I would do is just a local mock build, and it would take roughly 45 minutes, and then I would use Ansible to deploy it out to a bunch of test machines. Okay. Um, there are faster ways that you can do just to, you know, make DC image on the source, but then you're down to managing install and through. Like, you don't actually have to edit the grub file. Like, if you do um, make install, it will, it will do that yes. for you if you have the right packages installed, which they're installed by default on Fedora. But, but then, get rid of them. right, exactly. The problem is you have to go in and manually clean them up. Right. So. Because, I mean, doing a bisect is just not something. Yeah, bisect you have to do it manually, right. basically. I mean, Fedora's or uh, Laura's scripts make it so that you don't, but you still have to wait to build. Like directly from build to Yeah. So, so generally, when um, people have come to me with bisection, I generally try and encourage them to figure out what are the last two builds in Koji that actually worked, and then say, okay, once you've had those two tags, then you can start going down to the nitty gritty and trying to figure things out. Um, there actually is a. It's there though, I mean, if it doesn't work, we can fix it.
file systems, you said BTRFS is a, uh, still not right. Yeah. There are other file systems. Does anybody look at them to see if they're getting to be interesting in any way? I mean, in Fedora, not, like, obviously, somebody looks at them, but like the Bcash guy. I don't know what the heck he's doing, but he, he keeps coming up with this thing, and his benchmark numbers are neat. But, I, um, you know, I don't even know how to test that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it as well, is just that I don't think any of us really have done a lot of work with file systems, so therefore, I think a lot of this is on our radar, but we don't know exactly, we haven't really thought to try and push for it or bring it to our attention. So again, this may be a place where yeah. we need to start discussion on the mailing list about exactly what you have um, uh, to find. I mean, yeah. You know, so, ButterFS and Facebook, but Facebook doesn't use ButterFS for data, they only use on the root file system, so. Yeah. <laughs> so if you actually talk to some of the Red Hat file systems, guys that actually do that. Oh, data center and yeah, those guys. Mm -hmm. If you talk to them, they will tell you that in order to become production ready, a file system takes 10 years of development, yeah. right? So ButterFS is nowhere near that yet. Um, it's about halfway there maybe. Yes. But like you said, Facebook is using it for different purposes yeah. than what Fedora would use it. And Facebook employs all almost all of the ButterFS developers. Right? Mm -hmm. There's some guys from SUSE that actually contribute quite a bit to it. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done some fantastic things because they use it less for certain aspects, but they also cheated uh, in a smart way. I mean, I'm not, that's not derogatory, but they cheated. They turned off a lot of the interesting features, right? Okay. So you can you can run it, and you can do things like snapshots, but you can't do like on-flight compression, and you can't do uh, live data migration and some stuff that you could do otherwise in Fedora. Now, you can do it in Fedora, but you run the risk of losing your data, right? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, the interesting thing, in my opinion, is that whenever somebody asks me why we aren't using ButterFS, I always ask them, why do you want it? And they never actually talk about like the file system itself. They talk about wanting snapshots. They talk about yeah. wanting moving stuff around from machine to machine. The ease of use features, right? right. Um, and when you talk to the RHEL kernel guys, that they have an answer for it, but it's not as usable. Right. It's always take XFS and put it on top of device mapper and LVM right. and do it that way. And that's fantastic for enterprise users. The door users don't like those things. Uh, not all the time anyway. So it's it's mostly coming up with maybe a tool that mirrors what ButterFS product does and makes it easy to use those technologies as right. improve, right? Because people don't really care about which file system they're running, they care about the uses of that file system. Yeah. Okay, I think we're just about actually out of time, so. Can I strongly suggest that if you write a Fedora magazine or Fedora computer article about ways to interact with the kernel that you may say was a bit of a surprise? Yeah, so I think that's a good suggestion. I was planning on possibly turning some of this into a Fedora magazine article, so, yeah. Yeah, Brian. Accepted that Bugzilla is going to exist as Bugzilla. Yeah, there's just, you know, I don't know how many people that. Nice talk. Thank you. I, I posted a picture. Let me know if it's like, is it okay? <laughs> That's fine.
Sorry, Paul, I forgot to... 